but it's also rather subjective. Friendship means very different things to different people. As a therapist, I'm always thinking about a client's social network. Along with sleep patterns and appetite, this is an important indicator of a person's general functioning. When I work with a client who's suicidal, it's always critical to take into account that person's support systems. And by that I'm talking about family and friends. You probably know of adults who consider themselves loners and say that they are content with that condition. There can be a lot of pain involved with friendship. It's a risky business. When we make friends, or try to make them, we become vulnerable to rejection. Each of us probably has a painful childhood memory of being cast aside by one friend in favor of another. You may have heard of the concept of the overscheduled child who is always busy, always going off to piano lessons or football practice or ballet class. In some respects, friendship seems like a very straightforward topic. Everyone wants friends. Most of us have friends. But it's also rather subjective. Friendship means very different things to different people. What I'll be focusing on today is the importance of friendship to me as an individual and as a psychotherapist. And then on some ways in which friendship is challenged today. My first memory of consciously contemplating friendship was as a young boy. I was about six or seven years old and I heard an old song on the radio, People. People who need people are the luckiest people in the world. <laughs> and I remember thinking, is that really true? Uh, do we need people? And is it okay to need people? And as I've gotten older, more and more, I tend to answer that question in the affirmative. As a therapist, I'm always thinking about a client's social network. Along with sleep patterns and appetite, this is an important indicator of a person's general functioning. When I work with a client who's suicidal, it's always critical to take into account that person's support systems. And by that I'm talking about family and friends. Does that person feel supported in the world? Do they have meaningful connections? There are two reasons why I think about that. And the first one is, the person who does feel supported is much less likely to attempt suicide in the first place. Suicide is very often the manifestation of an abject sense of alienation. And second, if a person is suicidal, it's very important to hook them up with their support systems so that they can be monitored and, and kept safe. Someone without friends is almost certain to be depressed. You probably know of adults who consider themselves loners and say that they are content with that condition. My sense is that while that may in part be true, it's almost always the function of a defense mechanism. There can be a lot of pain involved with friendship. It's a risky business. When we make friends, or try to make them, we become vulnerable to rejection. Each of us probably has a painful 
childhood memory of being cast aside by one friend in favor of another. And that really hurts. Rejection by friends is especially painful for children. So many loners, after repeated rejection, adapt by consciously deciding not to get close to anyone. It's easier that way, and it's less painful. In effect, they're saying, if I tell you who I am, and you don't like who I am, that's all I got. So I don't want to take that chance. I don't want to let you know who I really am. And of course, it's impossible to form a friendship if you're isolating yourself from other people like this. To make friends, you have to run the risk of being rejected. I want to talk about some of the challenges to friendship that I see in modern life today. One has its roots in childhood, which of course is when we learn how to make friends. There has been a lot of study recently of how contemporary life affects children. You may have heard of the concept of the overscheduled child who is always busy, always going off to piano lessons or football practice or ballet class. Well, of course, activities are good, but children also need unstructured time. In a safe place, of course, where they can just hang out with their peers without tasks or deadlines. It is in those moments that a child can really get to know another child. And that is the basis of developing lifelong friendships. And of course, the pressures of modern life have an impact on adult friendships as well. Ask a friend today, how are you? And odds are the answer will be, I'm so tired, or I'm much too busy, or both. People spend more time at work, and the result is less quality time with family and friends. We may say that friendship is the most important thing in life. But that doesn't prevent us from moving across the country to take a better job if we have the opportunity. Now this brings me to another aspect of modern life that may influence friendships, and one that I find extremely interesting and at the same time worrisome. And that has to do with the impact that social networking has had on, on the way in which people conduct their friendships. Facebook. Instant messaging, texting, Twitter. These forms of communication are replacing to a great extent the kind of contact that friendships used to rely on. Face-to-face -face interaction. Go to any cafe or public place and it seems like almost everyone is wired. They're using some kind of electronic means of communication. Even if they are sitting with a group of friends I mentioned earlier how mobility, for example, moving across the country for a new job, how that presents a huge challenge if we're trying to maintain a friendship. And in the past, it would probably have spelled the end of the friendship. Well, clearly, Facebook, Skype, instant messaging, all of these tools make it possible now to maintain long distance relationships. You may have people yourself that you stay in close touch with using one of these tools. But let's look again at these people texting in a cafe. We call this social connectivity. And it's true that you can connect instantly with someone thousands of miles away. But it is not clear what the quality of that connection is whether it can truly be called an intimate friendship. I'm not saying these social networking tools are bad, and I think they can be vital to sustaining an existing friendship. But as far as making new friends, well, think about this verb that we use on Facebook, friending. 
to friend. Just how meaningful is it to say, I have 683 friends on Facebook. Are they really friends? In conclusion, in terms of human history, social networking is a relatively recent phenomenon. So we do not know what impact it will have on the nature of friendship. But I think it is safe to assume that friendship will survive. We are by nature social animals. We all want and need people in our lives that accept us and love us for who we are. The people we love and who love us back are our friends.